Pust, Anipadaidut Kamenia. Do you understand what I just said? Unless you speak Russian, you would never be able to understand the words, let the little children come to me. Jesus wants to speak to all children in every land, and your church's Sunday school can help. For just $5 per book, your students can adopt an LHF mission project that will provide Bible storybooks to waiting children in other lands. Learn more at lhfmissions.org forward slash children. Hey ladies, since this episode drops the week of July 4th, we decided that we would take a little vacation along with many of you and revisit one of our favorite episodes, the Hymn Sing with Sarah episode on Hymns for the Nation. Feels appropriate. So enjoy this episode and a hopefully lovely summertime. Sorry, I lost my notes. I have to go. I have too many tabs open. Here we go. So many Listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Erin. I'm Bree. And I'm Rachel. Today is a hymn sing with Sarah day. Oh. Oh. <laughs> la 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 la. That was awesome. And we're done. <laughs> End of the episode. <laughs> I am Bree. <laughs> so July 4th, Independence Day, is around now. This episode will be dropping around then. (laughs) And we always have some interesting conversations about that little section in our hymnal, the hymns for the nation. Brie, what is it actually? What is the title of it actually? Nation and National Songs. There we go. I don't actually have a hymnal in front of me for my own Mm -hmm. hymn sing episode. So there you go. (laughs) But (laughs) there is always a lot of... Mm, I don't know, controversial conversation. There's a lot of very strong opinions about these hymns. And I I get that. What's very interesting, and I, I will say this right away, that my opinion on these hymns, specifically the ones that we have in our hymnal, and even the ones that were in LW and TLH, my opinion on the ones that we have in our hymnal has changed for the better since going through uh, just like reading these hymns for this episode and also having a Dr. Bierman as our vacancy pastor for the last year, a little less than a year, doing a two realms Bible study with him. Mm. That has given me a lot more nuance about how to think about these things and thinking about the hymns that we have. And I'm not quite as cranky about them as I used to be, you know, two weeks ago. So (laughs) this is going to be a little bit different than what we normally talk about. Usually I'm like, I love all of these hymns and they're all amazing and I love every single one. This this didn't really come about that way. I wasn't actually sure that I wanted to do this episode. (laughs) Well, when we it said first you had to, yeah, you, made, you forced. We did it. talk you into it. Yeah, you yeah, did. We I don't did. think we forced you. We just talked to you. We talked it was to you. Someone mm-hmm. else's idea, mm-hmm. and you're like, you should do this. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do that. Do I really yeah. want to talk about these hymns? But we're going to do it because I think this is a valid and a good conversation for us to have about what it actually means to sing about our country, especially in our current kind of weird. It's a weird time in the country for like talking about religion and politics. There's just a lot of stuff that's gone down lately that makes this conversation uh, a little interesting. And we won't get into all of that today. I We don't want to be here for three hours. So I will say, since not everyone has had the opportunity to spend two years talking through Two Kingdoms Theology with Dr. Bierman, ah. you can also check out his book, Holy Citizens, God's Two Realms and Christian en- Engagement with the World. So I'm guessing, Sarah, you would recommend this for those who don't have the time to to uh, go back through. And I don't even know if they're available, all these studies, but I'm guessing they were amazing. Yes, they were amazing. And yes, his book is actually in my show notes. So yes, I would. Absolutely. If this conversation is really interesting to you or you want to know more about Two Realms Theology, which I'm going to like super quick overview in just a second, absolutely get Bierman's book. It's worth your time for sure. So 
I do want to give my usual shout out to Concordia Publishing House, the companion to the hymnal. There's only three of these hymns in the Lutheran service book. Mm. However, I still reference the companion to the hymnal. So Mm. as always, worth every penny. And I once again found fascinating stories about these hymns. So very interesting stuff. Before we get into these, I don't even want to call them, they're not even patriotic hymns. They're hymns for the nation or patriotic songs. And I'll talk about why I make that distinction later because I, I believe there is a distinction between the two. I do want to give you just a like my my uh, regurgitation of Bierman's Two Realms <laughs> theology Ooh. just because I think this gives us a really good foundation for thinking about these hymns because it's such a weird, like uncomfortable thing for us to talk about and a very opinionated topic. I think it's good to just kind of think about our two realms theology and Dr. Beamer, and hopefully I do you justice on this. I know you hate when people quote you, so I'm sorry. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to shout him out onto the beginning of your rap tracks and then it's okay. Yeah, I will not be doing a rap track. I am leaving that to flame. So two realms theology, a lot of people say, we often say like separation of church and state. And the way that Bierman teaches two realms theology, the way that that I now understand two realms, it isn't really separation of church and state the way that a lot of us think about it. Like there's this big wall between the church and the state and Mm -hmm. we always keep them separated. And that's, I don't. I don't think that's, that's a cool. legal concept, not a theological concept. Yeah, that isn't a helpful way to think about things. As, yeah, especially from a, a theological standpoint, that can get really tricky when we try to completely separate them because we are Christians and we live in this world and we believe that God is in control and reigns over everything, and that includes government. So, and so unless you want to build work? a big wall in your own heart, you right. need a different paradigm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I really like the way that this is laid out. I think it makes way more sense than is biblical. So it's a lot more about the relationship between us and the world and the relationship between us and God. And I'm going to throw out these terms. A lot of you have probably heard these. Coram mundo, before the world, the relationship between us and the world. Coram deo, relationship between us and God. I love these terms. They're super useful. So as Lutherans, of course, we believe that God is at work in both of those spaces between us and other people, between us and him. And these realms kind of work under two different principles. So we're not, we are not looking to make America a Christian nation. And that might be a super unpopular opinion. And there's a lot of stuff that goes along with that. And I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but there's that's another episode. That another is, time, that is a different episode. And I'm sure people have a lot of opinions about that, but we are interested as Lutherans, as Christians in having a just government because we believe that God works through the government, regardless of who is in power. And that's mm-hmm. a very different thing than making our government Christian. If that that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. So we confess <laughs> that government is a good gift from God. It's a good thing for us, regardless of who is in power. And we thank him for it. Right. Yep. But we also I'm, don't put our ultimate trust in earthly leaders, but yeah. in Christ. Mm-hmm. I'm reminded here. I just it just sort of happens. I just finished rereading the book of Judges, which says wow. over and over again, in those days, there was no king and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Right. Mm-hmm. Like if we don't, if God has not put a government over us, There's just chaos. Mm -hmm. And so even when the government isn't exactly our cup of tea, it's a good gift of God. Right. To curb evil. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is also an interesting thing to think about and play that out, how it uh, affects us in our daily lives. So with these two realms, like when we pit church and state against each other, not helpful. But when we have these two realms, they aren't really at odds at each other. Mm -hmm. It's not church versus state. It's not kingdom of God versus kingdom of the devil or, or those types of things that sometimes we hear about or think about. God is at work in all of these places. So we have the temporal realm or the left hand kingdom, and that is how we interact with each other. And then we have the spiritual realm or the right hand kingdom, and that is how we interact with God. So in this temporal realm, the law is central. We're going to do law and gospel here because we're good Lutherans, right? The law, the will of God is central and the government is the responsible party. The goal of this realm is the right function of creation and the civil servants are in charge. Its tool is the sword it's interested in ethics and it's working toward peace. So on the flip side of that, in the spiritual realm, the gospel is central, right? Mm -hmm. The church is the responsible party rather than the government. The goal is the restoration of creation, which we know 
is coming, right? Mm. The servants of the word are in charge rather than civil servants. Its tool is God's word rather than the sword. Its interest is the means of grace. Hello, church, right? Yep. And we have peace now through Jesus Christ. So as Christians, Amen. We- Right. We live in both of these spaces at the same time. And there's a whole lot more we can talk about in another episode. And it's hard. Yeah. yeah. It's a difficult tension. Just because we can talk about it like this does not mean it's easy. We all have to figure out like Mm -hmm. how we work in both of these things, how all of this kind of plays out in our own vocation. Vocation plays a huge part because we are children of God, but then we also work in this world, right? We do the work that God has given us to do in our vocation. So, That's a different tangent. I'm not going down that way. But I think that is a helpful thing for us to think about as we consider these songs that we sing around 4th of July or any other time during the year, Mm -hmm. specifically as Americans, too. So I I did a poll in the Facebook group and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but I did ask for ladies that live outside of the U.S. if this is a thing for them. And they're like, yeah, this isn't. We don't sing patriotic or hymns for the nation or anything. My eldest daughter recently asked her German foreign exchange student if they do patriotic hymns. And she said, no. Yeah, right. <laughs> like this, this almost seems to be, and maybe not uniquely because I don't, I did not study this at all, but I'm just thinking about what I, what the ladies in the group said and just about the hymns that I found in all of our hymnals across denominations. It seems to be a bit of an American thing to like have this need to have religious or quasi-religious songs about our nation. It's a very interesting Mm -hmm. thing to think about. Because of the nature of these hymns, I did uh, go into Chaplain Denzer's office and I like looked through a whole bunch of hymnals from across Mm -hmm. denominations because I was thinking, if we're talking about thanking God for our nation and these patriotic hymns, I bet that other denominations might have more of these hymns than we do, thinking like the Methodists, Presbyterians, Baptists, just because of our differences in theology and... I don't know, more quote unquote American Christian denominations. And they did have a lot more that Mm. I found. I think most of them were older hymnals, which our TLH from the 1940s also has 10 of these hymns. Lutheran service book only has three. Mm. And Rachel, you said you looked in a newer Methodist hymnal and that one had like three or four. It was four. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the older one that I looked at had, I think it was at least 10. So and this is, I mean, this is a super brief, very small sample size, but it, it wouldn't really surprise me if older hymnals just kind of had more of these hymns and our newer hymnals across denominations don't. That's just my Any own theory. Any reason wrong. as to why that is? I don't know. Change in culture. Okay. Well, and I think, yeah, the culture has changed. In the, in the first 100, 150 years of America's history, people were super, super patriotic. Because the nation was new. It was this new thing and a government of the people, by the people, for the people. I mean, and there was also this sort of conflation of America with the Old Testament promised land, Mm. you know, and we're still living with some of that tension there. Yeah. Um, And America was very heavily Christian. It was very pro-America and very heavily Christian, thanks to all those great awakenings. And so people naturally looked for ways to put the two together. Mm-hmm. And both of those things, America is less Christian and also less nationalistic yeah. than it has at some points well, been. Yeah. And mm, we won a lot of wars. <laughs> uh, we did win a lot of wars. <laughs> and like you mentioned, Germany. And I know I saw a little discussion in the Facebook group about Japan. Yeah. Like, like patriotism after losing a major war is a very different well, and since yeah. so many of those wars were started by excessive nationalistic yeah. fervor, yeah. it yeah. left Absolutely. a sour taste in their mouth. Like if you uh-huh. fell prey to this excessive nationalism and it led you into a very traumatic war that you lost, uh-huh. you're going to have a different Absolutely. attitude so toward it in the future. Out of the right. sanctuary. Yeah. Oh, flag <laughs> sanctuaries. We could go down that That's tangent too. Let's episode. not do that. Let's do hymns. Let's do hymns. Yes. So considering that, that cultural context of the 30s and 40s as German Lutherans, it does kind of make a lot of sense why there were so many, just talking Lutheran hymnals, mm-hmm. why there were so many in the TLH. Sure. That was just a very interesting culture. <laughs> German Lutheran. Yes. As, as if to say through a heavy German accent, we are American. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 So that, that made a lot of sense to me that, that there were more, way more in the, in the 40s mm-hmm. and just less now. And we have 
as we mature as a church body and just move through time, we have so many hymns. Like it's mm-hmm. insane the amount of hymns true. that we have. And yeah. I mean, they had to pick and choose what to put in. So they yeah. picked the best of the best. And I think they did a great job with the ones that are in our hymnal. What I did find interesting, if you have a Lutheran hymnal at home, I won't talk about this much because I do have a lot of notes, but the texts of the hymns in TLH are just very different than hymns that we sing now. The language is very stark. It's very much a, we are terrible people in this country. God, please don't smite us, but bring us peace. Like it's hmm. it's very stark language about how horrible we are as people and like, please bring us peace. And our huh. na- hymns for nation now are not uh-huh, like that at right. all. I was just taken aback a little reading that language. And Rachel pointed out too that there are a lot of hymns in TLH across all of the different sections of the hymnal is that are in language that we just don't use anymore. Hmm. So just an interesting thing to point out. If you like reading through hymnals randomly like I do, pick up a TLH and read through some of them. I would be curious. I don't know. The way things are going, we might want to actually reclaim some of those old Don't Smite Us hymn texts. <laughs> that is not a bad idea, actually. Uh, there, were, there are some uh-huh. very good ones if you're looking uh-huh. for that. But anyway... <laughs> Like I said, whenever these come up, these hymns for the nation in our hymnal, there there does seem to be two very distinct camps about whether or not we should sing them in church, whether or not we should sing them at all. And I think there's a distinction between singing hymns that thank and praise God for this good gift of government, for his provisions for us through that government, for the freedoms that we have, all of those things. There's a difference between those hymns, which are the ones we have in our hymnal, and the hymns that we're singing about how much we love our country, how beautiful Mm. our country is, that Mm. may or may not mention a generic-ish God. Those I would categorize as patriotic songs, Mm -hmm. not necessarily hymns. Mm -mm. And you, I mean, you can argue a bit about what the definition of a hymn is, but by definition, a hymn is a religious song. And Mm -hmm. some of those patriotic quote unquote songs, I don't really know if those are religious or not. The ones we have in our hymnal, I would say absolutely yes, because of the nature of them, because we... Yes, it's a hymn about our nation, but we're thanking God for that nation. Yep. It's about him and his gifts to us, not about how much we how much we love something. Right. Does that make sense? There, yep. Yeah. The difference between God and country versus country and God. Yes. Yep. 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 And there are some that aren't in our hymnal that you you probably could get away with in a worship setting if it's done in the right context. Something like God Bless America. Yeah. Maybe I wouldn't do it, but you could argue for some of them in the right context with the right understanding of what you're singing about. You might be able to get away with them, doing them in public with a bunch of people that you don't know are Christian. You not actually know whose God you're singing to together. That can get a little, Mm. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah. Yeah. So on to the music after, you know, 20 minutes of talking about whatever. Other stuff. It's good stuff. I'm not going <laughs> to lie to you. So I did do a poll in the Facebook group, as usual, asked for a lot of feedback. There were like 65 comments and over 1100 responses to the poll. Wow. So a lot of conversation about it. I think this may be the most actual conversation there's ever been on a hymn poll. Uh, usually it's just like, a, I don't know which ones to pick. They're all my favorites. This time there was some... <laughs> <laughs> this time there was some really good conversation and yeah. one person did say they're all my favorite I didn't think anyone would one person <laughs> <there you laughs> are. proved me wrong that it's possible new under the sun <laughs> <laughs> the poll is still up if you want to go look at it I do want to mention three comments from the group that were interesting Lisa said, I appreciate giving thanks for good blessings such as our country, but language that pits our country against others or forgets the church around the world seems to lose a biblical perspective. Yes. Laura said, I love my country, Tis of Thee, and America the Beautiful. Not during the divine service, though. My school kids and I used to sing both as we raised the flag each morning. This year we learned my country, Tis of Thee, for school. And my son, nine, said, that's a really neat song, but I wouldn't really want to sing it in church because it's mostly about how we love our country and not much about our God in it. That's a good kid. Right Wise there. kid. There you go. Yeah. And Ruth said, I grew up with many of these and I still enjoy them. However, I now live in France, attend a confessional Lutheran church that is in fellowship with LCMS, and there isn't anything close to this in the hymnal. We certainly pray for our country, pray for the leaders, pray for elections to go smoothly and for discernment in our votes. 
but there is next to no patriotism. I don't know if it's because of a different French attitude or because Lutherans in France have a more reticent view toward the secular state due to the history of difficulties with the state. Hmm. Nothing whatsoever is done for national days beyond prayers. So just a very- That's really interesting. I wonder if that might be, you know, if we did this again 20 years from now, if our country might be more on that boat. Maybe. Mm We'll have to come back. Round two. Yeah. In 20 years. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully Jesus will have come back by then. I'm not going to lie to you. I'll be yeah. honest. Straight yeah. up. Okay, that would be better. I wouldn't argue with that at yeah. all. Yep. So by far, the two favorites are Lutheran Service Book 965, God Bless Our Native Land. A very Mm -hmm. fine choice. And LSB 717, Eternal Father Strong to Save, Mm -hmm. which, interestingly enough, is not one of the hymns for the nation. In this poll, I did include, so there's only three hymns for the nation. 964, Lift Every Voice and Sing. That That was our postlude. Mm-hmm. On Sunday because of Juneteenth. So it was great. Nice. Uh, 965, God bless our native land. And 966, before you, Lord, we bow. That's it. Those are the only ones that are prescribed in that particular section. Mm-hmm. However, on July 4th, other times we do patriotic things. There are a lot of other hymns that people tend to sing. 717, Eternal Father Strong to Save. The text isn't really along the same lines, but everybody sings it around this time. So I threw it in there. People loved it. Is it a Navy hymn, though? It says. Yeah, it is. It is. It's a Navy hymn. But I don't know. Are you going to cover this one later? I am. You are? Okay. Pause that thought, Brie. It is the Navy hymn. Pause. to it. Yes. We will have comments on that in a second. There's also 951, O God of Love, O King of Peace, which is in the Hymns for the Nation sections in both Lutheran... I almost said Lutheran hmm. Witness, LW. <laughs> Lutheran Worship. <laughs> Wrong LW. And Worship Supplement 69, which is my favorite little hymnal. The little red one that I didn't know about until I started doing this podcast. So it's it actually is a hymn for the nation mm. in both of those hymnals, but not in LSB, even though mm. it's in LSB. Mm-hmm. Interesting that stuff just kind of got shuffled around. And also um, Lutheran Service Book 659, which was in Worship Supplement 69, Lord of Our Life and God of Our Salvation. That's a really well-known one. And also Lutheran Service Book 777, Grant Peace We Pray in Mercy, Lord. Not in the nation hymn section, but after going through this, I would highly suggest using that one if you don't want to do it like a patriotic kind of service, which is totally fine. Mm. But if you want to have a hymn that kind of touches on July 4th without actually being overtly about patriotic things, that's a great one to use Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because it's about praying for peace in our nation and it's it's a one line or two so it's nice and short fantastic text and tune i love it so there's also a couple more in the lutheran worship section for hymns for the nation 499 christ by heavenly hosts adored and 501 god of our fathers whose almighty arm which is a very popular one and then There was one extra one in Worship Supplement 69, O God of Earth and Altar, interestingly enough, written by G.K. Chesterton. That was the only fact I could find about that hymn because I don't, (laughs) there is no, I don't think there's a companion for the Worship Supplement. So interesting factoid on that one. And then there's a bunch in TLH. We've got Judge Eternal, Throned in Splendor. I think that's one of my favorite ones. Mm. Lord, while for all mankind we pray, which is also in Lutheran worship. I believe that's in other denomination hymnals as well. 579, Almighty Lord before thy throne. 580, to thee, O God, we fly. 581, all ye who on this earth do dwell. 582, God, Lord of Sabaoth, thou who ordainest. 583, great King of Nations, hear our prayer. And 584, swell the anthem, raise the song. So there's a bunch in TLH. Some of them are really interesting. I kind of like them. Okay, I just Googled Oh God of Earth and Altar. It is a fabulous hymn, but it is. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Okay. And that, and that was go only- Google Oh God of Earth and Altar by G.K. Chesterton. He's such a good poet. And that one was only in worship supplement. It didn't even make it into Lutheran worship, which is interesting. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that one is also across denominations as well. That is not well, just Well, and it does have much more language of smiting and Yes, it does. <laughs> that might be why it was less popular during the second half of the 20th century. There's a lot of talk of smiting in these older hymns. It's very interesting. Yeah. I have a question. With the TLH, what's the position in the hymnal? Are they still near the end of the hymnal? Or do you know, are they? They're the 500s, so uh-huh. yes. Oh my gosh, okay. look at this photographic memory. Okay. I believe so. Well, I have the numbers written down. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. 
<laughs> you were like moving off in the space though, like you were doing a math equation. Well, I was because TLH started at the one at one hundred, uh huh, and goes up, and yeah. LSB starts yeah. at three thirty, three thirty three, or whatever, uh-huh. and goes up. So yeah, the f- the five eighties are near the, the end, it's still near the yeah. end. Okay, okay. I don't have my TLH with me. Anyway, and then, of course, we have the all-popular, typical American patriotic songs that aren't in our hymnal, but they are in many other denominational Mm -hmm. hymnals. They're Mm -hmm. everywhere. We've got Battle Hymn of the Republic, of course. Mm, Classic. Classic. God Bless America. God Bless the USA. I don't think that one's in hymnals. I think that's just a patriotic song. (laughs) Wait. Excuse me? (laughs) Excuse uh, like okay. Lee Greenwood. She took it back. She she walked it back. She walked it back. Not in hymnals. Okay. Ooh. That one is not in hymnals. Aaron God knows. bless America oh. is. God bless the USA is not. <laughs> Aaron knows my story hate affair of that song. Lee Greenwood. <laughs> America the Beautiful, My Country Tis of Thee, and the Star Spangled Banner is mm-hmm. in several hymnals. So in my own opinion, the ones that we have in our hymnal, very fine choices for worship. I don't think you'd have any problem singing these in a worship service. The other list, meh, maybe not, not so much. So that was a very, very long list of hymns. I am not going to talk about all of them because that's far too many. And there's some very interesting stories Zero about in. about just a few of them. Yes, uh, mm. we're not going to go there. Uh-huh. So... Lutheran Service Book 964, Lift Every Voice and Sing. I already covered this one Mm -hmm. in the Black History Month podcast from 2021. Mm -hmm. Highly recommend. I won't talk about it right now. We have too much to do. But I would highly recommend going back and listening to that podcast and learning about the story of that one there. It's It's a great hymn. So Lutheran Service Book 965, God Bless Our Native Land. I can't even say it without like trying to sing it in my head, which is also in TLH 577 and Lutheran Worship 497. So this one has been a popular one for a long time. It's in a lot of hymnals. I learned a lot of things researching this hymn that I did not know, mostly because I've never bothered to actually look into it. But surprisingly to me anyway, this is not originally a British hymn for the Queen. I totally thought it was. What? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, keep going. Although... Most of us know the last line saying, God save the queen. Mm-hmm. That is not the original line. What? Oh. I know. It wasn't even originally in English, which also blew my mind. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Very surprising stories to me when I start looking into these hymns. So the two stanzas we have are a free rendering of a patriotic hymn for the kingdom of Saxony, Germany, hmm. written in 1815 hmm. by Siegfried August Malmann and published in G.W. Fink's Zeitung für die Elegante Feld. Hmm. So I would redo the original German, but it wouldn't mean anything to you, and I'd probably butcher it. So here's the translation from the brilliant Dr. Joe Hurl. This is the original hymn. God bless Saxony, where loyalty has stood firm in storm and night. Eternal righteousness, high above the sea of time, who commands every storm, protect us with power. Blossom joyfully, thou Kranselin, I think is how you pronounce it, and that is... I had to read the footnote on this one. It's the diagonal green band of trefoil leaves on the Saxon coat of arms. So Hmm. blossom joyfully, thou Cranslin, in the luster of lovelier days. Hail, devout father thou. Hail, good mother thou. Dearly we acclaim you lovingly in chorus. That which faithful hearts plead arises to the heights of heaven, out of night to the light. He who saw our love, he who saw our tears, he is near to us with his help. Do not forsake us. Hmm. So that's the original to the translation, okay. Dr. Okay. Hurl's translation of the original German hymn. So it was first sung on November 13th, 1815, in the presence of the King of Saxony. So this is kind of a big deal when it was originally written. Mm-hmm. The hymn we have now in LSB is a composite of sorts-ish from Charles T. Brooks, who lived 1813 to 1853, and his friend John S. Dwight, who lived 1813 to 1893. So Charles Brooks translated stanzas one and three. And if you're listening to the text, one and three are the most similar to the two stanzas Mm. we have. He translated stanzas one and three of the German hymn, which he was studying at Harvard Divinity School. So his translation Sounds kind of similar. God bless our native land. Firm may she ever stand through storm and night. When the wild tempests rave, ruler of wind and wave, eternal father, save us by thy might. 
sounds pretty similar. Lo, our hearts' prayers arise into the upper skies, regions of light. He who hath heard each sigh watches each weeping eye. He is forever nigh, venger of right. I, I think the um, we get the tune from God Save the Queen. I believe yeah. these lyrics that I'm I'm looking it up right now. The God Save the King lyric actually predates 1815. It's from the 1700s. So I think we have two oh, separate streams of Merge where the, one. the the lyrics that we use are exactly as you describe them, having this this provenance, whereas God Save the King or Queen was on a different track. They just use the same tune. They do use the same tune. Although yes. God Saves the State comes in a little bit later. Yeah. So okay. Keep going. I think I'm right. I just don't want all the the Brits to, to write in and be like, yeah, no, our national anthem is our national anthem. We didn't get it from Germany. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. That, oh, that is not what I'm saying. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> All our British listeners out there. I'm, oh. oh, right, I know. Hello. <laughs> Wait, they've already know. written. No, yeah. right. I'm, just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying the hymn that we sing, I assumed came from Britain, and it did not. That's okay, what yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yep. Keep going then. So John Dwight was a music critic in Boston at the time, and he changed the last two lines of stanza one and wrote a new stanza two, which is where the stanza we know comes from, mm. plus a third stanza that was identical to the first one, except for the first line of it. We don't use that one, though. Mm. Charles and John might possibly have worked together on these revisions. This is the form of the hymn that appeared in 1841, and then another revision happened before 1845 that changed the last three lines of stanza two, into what we have today. So, God bless our native land, firm may she ever stand through storm and night. When the wild tempests rave, ruler of wind and wave, do thou our country save by thy great might. And the stanza two we know, so shall our prayers arise to God above the skies. On him we wait. Thou who art ever nigh, guarding with watchful eye, to thee aloud we cry, God save the state. There you go. And this has been a very popular national hymn in our Lutheran circles, as it's been in all three of our hymnals. It asks God for the preservation of the state and the good government it provides, which is something we are totally on board with. Government and our country are first article gifts from God, and we pray for our governing authorities. And mm. as we have pointed out, the tune is national anthem. That's what it's called. And it is the national anthem of the United Kingdom, which is why we so often associate hmm. this hymn with Britain, even the though it's not. The music is. Yeah. And that is my one gripe with this hymn, because every time I sing it, I feel a little cheeky, like I'm stealing somebody else's national anthem. I mean, yeah. we kind of are. <laughs> and now... But aren't I'm, there other national anthems that we yes, use um, for him? The tune Austria is Germany's national anthem. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I'm not saying it's a precedent. That's Germany's national mm -hmm. anthem. Now I I should have I should have looked up who wrote Britain's national anthem. Now I'm really curious. Oh yeah, the text is not even anywhere close to our hymn. The source music. They're two different just, things. The big finish. Yeah. Seems yeah. We, like, I always associate this with yeah. God save the queen, but it's not like they're two different things. Uh -huh. two yeah. Different things. So interesting. Okay. okay. Okay, so that puts a nice bow on that one. Super interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. So the other one in Lutheran Service Book, Before You, Lord, We Bow, also in the Lutheran Hymnal, too many acronyms in my notes, and Lutheran Worship. So another one that has a long standing history in our Lutheran Hymnals. Who do you think wrote this one? Oh, you're looking at it. Are you all looking at it? No. I already knew because I love this hymn. I think we've talked about it before, too. I, on, I think, Rachel, know. it was one of your let, quizzes. Let Aaron I think. guess. Let Aaron oh, guess. Like, she has oh, yeah, it wasn't a quiz. Um, it wasn't a quiz, yeah. You can do it. I believe in you. Not a Louis Bourgeois. <laughs> Dang it. No. <laughs> oh, man, I close. Wish. Very wish. close. Just You get like points for just like bringing him up again because we love him. Yes. It was close. No, he's my favorite. That was a good guess. <laughs> yeah, that's one it? guess. Oh, you don't want to guess two more times? Okay. Oh, uh, no, I don't. I, I don't have two more She just wanted anything. to say bourgeois. Okay. Bourgeois. <laughs> it was Francis Scott Key. Oh. What? Yes, okay. his his B side. Because yeah, <laughs> that's our that's our national anthem, yeah. right? Oh. Yep, it is the B side. It is the yes, the B side okay. of the national anthem is "Before You, Lord, We Bow." Ah. <laughs> okay, yeah. So Francis Scott Key, he lived seventeen seventy nine to eighteen forty three. Of course, he 
wrote our Star Spangled Banner. He also wrote this hymn, probably anticipating the 56th anniversary of American independence in 1832. He titled it Hymn for the 4th of July, 1832. So (laughs) singing this one on 4th of July. Very appropriate. 56th anniversary. 56th anniversary. That makes our country sound so young. But no, that's such a (laughs) random number, I feel like. Also that. It was published in the Baltimore Sun on July 4th, 1848. And again, in his posthumous Poems of the Late Francis S. Key Esquire in 1857. So Mm -hmm. the original hymn had seven stanzas. We do not have seven stanzas. Mm -hmm. Since we've included it in LCMS hymnals, we've omitted stanzas three and four. Interestingly, though, his third stanza, original third stanza, reminisced about the American Revolutionary War. Since it was only 56 years later, a lot of the people that were alive then would have remembered it. It would have been in their relatively recent memory. And so he wrote a stanza about it. And that stanza goes, Our fathers sought thee, Lord, and on thy help relied. Thou heardst and gavest... He likes those punctuation mm-hmm. hurts and gives the word and all their needs supplied led by their hand to victory they hailed a free and rescued land so that's his mm-hmm. third stanza we don't sing that obviously mm-hmm. this is another hymn that is very clearly singing about thanking god for his bountiful blessings acknowledging him as lord over all things summoning all of the people on the earth to live in the light of god's word and then even throws in An eschatological stanza at the end that anticipates the coming of Christ, which you generally don't find eschatological hymn stanzas in patriotic songs. Mm. Not usually. Maybe in a couple. Not usually. It's what's most important, honestly. Yeah, because that's actually what points very clearly to Jesus, which you don't find Jesus specifically in a lot of other patriotic hymns either. (laughs) So I don't believe that. (laughs) Yeah, no ambiguous God in this one. So this text is, Before you, Lord, we bow, our God, who reigns above and rules the world below, boundless in power and love. Our thanks we bring in joy and praise, our hearts we raise to you, our King. The nation you have blessed may well your love declare, from foes and fears at rest, protected by your care. For this bright day, for this fair land, gifts of your hand, our thanks we pay. May every mountain height and each vale and forest green shine in your words pure light and its rich fruits be seen. May every tongue be tuned to praise and join to raise a grateful song. Earth, hear your maker's voice, your great redeemer own. Believe, obey, rejoice, and worship him alone. Cast down your pride, your sin deplore, and bow before the crucified. Mm. Jesus. And Jesus. When in, <laughs> and when in power he comes, O oh may our native land from all its rending tombs send forth a glorious band, mm. a countless throng with joy to sing to heaven's high king salvation's song. Beautiful. This is mm-hmm. why I was not a, really a fan of these hymns before, but I kind of am now. They're actually kind of cool. That last verse just gets me every time. Like, a nation may do all sorts of great and wonderful things, but this is the goal, right? Yeah. This is the goal that when in power he comes, there will be tons of people springing out of the soil rejoicing to greet him. Like the the whole point of everything is that. Right. And, well, and yeah. I look just briefly looking at the words of each of these, like 964 is sort of like this hymn of praise mm-hmm. to God. Yeah. And then 965 and 966 really are just prayers. They are. Of multiple stanzas mm-hmm. to God. Right. right. Not to America. Mm-hmm. Right. But the focus is appropriate. Yes, mm-hmm. exactly. Mm-hmm. I might like these. I might ding, not ding, be a hater yeah. anymore. Right. Yeah. Right. I know. My my mind was changed. Falling down. Happy surprises. Uh, right? I was not expecting to actually enjoy this podcast. <laughs> Neither was I. Neither was Maybe I. Maybe I should put a disclaimer on the beginning of this. Please don't stop listening before you start. <laughs> so the tune for this one is Darwell's 148th which we also use for Christ is our cornerstone. So if you know that hymn, which you probably do, that's a pretty popular one. Mm-hmm. You'll know the tune for this one. John Darwell wrote hymn tunes for all 150 Psalms in Tate and Brady's. I feel like that should be a band these days, Tate mm-hmm. and Brady, like a good bluegrass band. Anyway, mm. Tate, <laughs> Tate and Brady's new version of the Psalms of David published in 1696. So that's a very old. So not new anymore. 
not new. But see, mm-hmm. Renaissance and bluegrass are very closely related, in my opinion. So that would totally make so. sense mm-hmm. for a bluegrass band. But anyway, sorry. This <laughs> this was the tune for the 148th Psalm, Ye Boundless Realms of Joy. So, mm-hmm. so those are the only three hymns in Lutheran Service Book under the nation heading. But we do, like I said, tend to use several others for Independence Day or anything else that is kind of patriotic in nature. So I do have a couple more. Okay. And a fun one just for kicks and giggles at the end. (laughs) Maybe not fun. I don't know. So Eternal Father, Strong to Save, fan favorite. Everybody loves, well, I shouldn't say everyone, 23% of the people who were polled, which Mm. was the winner. Winner, winner, chicken dinner was Eternal Father, Strong to Save. (laughs) Okay. You know what that says? It says we got a lot of veterans. Yup. In our, which is awesome. Yes, it's, it's a beautiful because this is it a is military beautiful. hymn. Specifically, it is a navy hymn. Although Yay. the other, is, uh... <laughs> yes, it's also appropriate in times of travel. And I'm going on vacation in four <gasps> days, so yes. that's what I'll be singing on the way. This, this. hymn, mm. this hymn, my is husband's perfect. gonna be like, "What are you doing, weirdo?" <laughs> mm. Isn't that like everyday occurrence? At yes. least it is in my household. At least once a day. Yep. Sorry, anyway. I was going to tell you a story, but it's totally off topic. So anyway. (laughs) (laughs) It'll surface later, I'm sure. (laughs) Probably. So the text, Eternal Father strong to save, whose arm hath bound the restless wave, who bids the mighty ocean deep its own appointed limits keep. O hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea. O Christ, whose voice the waters heard and hushed their raging at thy word, who walks on the foaming deep and calm amid its rage did sleep. Oh, hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea. Most Holy Spirit, who didst brood upon the chaos dark and rude, and bid its angry tumult cease, and give for wild confusion peace. Oh, hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea. O Trinity of love and power, our people shield in danger's hour. From rock and tempest, fire and foe, protect them wheresoever they go. Thus evermore shall rise to thee glad praise from air and land and sea. Definitely a fan favorite. Mm-hmm. So this hymn was written in 1860 by William Whiting, who lived 1825 to 1878 in England. And it was published in 1861 in, drum roll, hymns ancient and modern, mm-hmm. of course. Really? You don't say. <laughs> I always just chuckle when I find that because everything is in that hymnal. We know it well as a sailor's hymn and also, of course, as the Navy hymn. And it may have been written for one of Whiting's students who is about to sail to the United States. Hmm. The opening lines of the hymn are inscribed above the chancel of the chapel of the U.S. Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. The tune Melita is the Latin name for Malta, where the Apostle Paul was shipwrecked. It was Hmm. written specifically for this hymn text by one of England's best-known church musicians of the 19th century, John Bacchus Dykes, who was in another podcast, and I didn't look up which one he was in, but I have talked about him for something else. He's he's <laughs> all over the place in our hymnal. Kudos to uh, John Dykes' parents for realizing that John Dykes is a rather boring name and giving him the middle name Bacchus. Right? Yep. Mm. <laughs> that makes his mm. name so interesting. Mm, yes. <laughs> So this I hymn became we chose to list it as just B. Yes, right. It evokes a certain <laughs> reputation. Honestly, it does. If my middle name was that, I would, I would, I would not. Use it. I would not. Uh-huh. I would not advertise that. Oh, I but. would totally use it. Name. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, this hymn became very popular very quickly in the English speaking world. It was first published in America in 1864, so just three years later, in Nehemiah Adams. I love these long 1800s hymnal names. <laughs> Church pastorals, hymns and tunes for public and social worship. It's actually mm. pretty short. It's so it not was, a German one, that's no. for sure. <laughs> right? Several changes were made to the original manuscript when it was published in Hymns Ancient and Modern. And our Lutheran service book has retained most of those changes. You've probably also noticed that there's Navy hymn stanzas, and there's also different stanzas for two and three. So those stanzas were written by Robert Spencer and were originally published with Whiting stanzas one and four in a missionary service book in 1937 from the Protestant Episcopal Church. So he added those stanzas to include a plea to God for his protection for all who travel by land and air as well as sea. So Mm. wait a second. You said Whiting wrote four? Yeah. 
But Wait. why would he talk about the air? This was back way before there were planes. Why would he talk about hot air balloons? I believe the the last line is alternate is an alternate version. Oh, yeah. Okay, yes. Slightly. Things have been edited. Okay. okay. Yeah, but Whiting did write. He was the okay. original author for the four stanzas. Got it. Got it. There. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, they, they retrofitted it to work for multiple services of the armed forces. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Sky, surf, and turf. And space. And space. Oh, well, yeah. The, and that's an interesting point because I can tell you from personal experience, there are not just four stanzas to this hymn. Mm. Oh. That there have been. Obviously, we have our two versions one that's all Navy and one that's Navy, Army, Air Force, you know, all the services. But we also, in the chapel here at Subbase New London, sing a verse that is specifically for submariners. Oh. Um, yeah. And I've got here in front of me, maybe we can include this in the show notes. I, as a Navy chaplain's wife, I, this is a very beloved hymn in my life. But there are over 100 additional verses that have been wow. cobbled together. Right. They have verses for like marriages or Thanksgivings, for change of commands, for right. Navy no, fields, for submariners. There, uh -huh. There's even satirical verses for please don't write any more verses. <laughs> there are no more verses verses. <laughs> For those Navy who are with this hymn. <laughs> wow. <Yeah. laughs> I love so, it. It's a, you know, it's it's basically this is a hymn. Obviously, the original is still the the coolest, coolest, but mm -hmm. it is one that gets altered as needed for the situation. And oh. some of the newer verses, like the submarine verses, are really beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, like they wow. really are done in in respect and and homage to the original. Hmm. So when does the submariner one mention Jonah? Jonah. <gasps> um, I can look it up. Hang on. I don't want to Just know. Those it it does. Fish guts. <laughs> yeah. Like it should. Lord who was on, it's like way down. It's in the S's in my 101 <laughs> plus document. Oh, there's so many verses. So one for Navy spouses. That's hey! pretty cool. Nice. That's for you. Um, <laughs> a bunch for POWs. But yeah, they, and they keep uh, the Space Force. Now they've got, you know, a verse that works for them, although it is. Oh. I, I think the other services, either they don't have their own hymns or their hymns aren't as cool. Um, <laughs> so they, they borrow the Navy hymn because it really is a gorgeous hymn. It's so good. Joke's on you all. I'm going to write a Space Force hymn. <gasps> Do it. Okay, there are, I see three possible stanzas for submariners and none yeah. of them mentions Jonah. So oh, no. get on that, people. Let's write a submarine movies. verse mentioning Jonah. I'm so disappointed. That okay. seems like a project for you. Fan okay. fiction. Let's do it. Except not yeah. fiction. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Fan nonfiction? <laughs> <laughs> so this hymn, in all its popularity, has been sung on many momentous occasions over the last hundred years. Not surprising. Winston Churchill chose to have it sung at divisions aboard HMS Prince of Wales when he and Franklin D. Roosevelt had their secret meeting in the North Atlantic during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. It was one of Roosevelt's favorites, and it was sung at his funeral in Hyde Park, New York, on April 14th, 1945, and also for the state funeral of John F. Kennedy on November 25th, 1963. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who are opera fans, Benjamin Britten he even used it in his opera, Neue Flood, in 1958, which I need to cool. go listen to. Because love that one. Britain is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Benjamin Britten is amazing, and I love his operas. Okay. Fun stuff. So that is, that rounds out Eternal Father Strong to Save. Excellent. It's a great one. Thank you for including it. I mean, I know it's not technically a patriotic hymn, mm -hmm. but for anybody who has served their nation, especially in one of the sea services, mm -hmm. it just means so much to be able to pray for protection for those who serve their nation in this way. Yep, absolutely. So two bonus ones. One is from Lutheran Worship because I actually really like this one. God of our fathers, whose almighty arm. Mm. This one is highly popular in American Christianity. It's in so many huh. other denomination okay. hymnals. It has nearly 400 mentions on hymnary.org. I don't is, remember this one at all. So tell I, me about it. I The only reason I know it we must have sung it at my church randomly for something. Oh, Memor I bet you it was for Memorial Day weekend. I don't know. It was in our bulletin at some point. And so I, because I didn't grow up with Lutheran worship. I don't, the only things I know about Lutheran worship I know from doing these podcasts. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I sung it somewhere along the way very recently this year. Hmm. And I was like, oh, I kind of like this one. It is 
super popular. It's not in Lutheran service book, so I don't have a ton of information on it because the Lutheran worship companion to the hymnal is smaller than our Lutheran service book. <laughs> it's a very small book. Doesn't have a ton of information. But I can tell you it was written in 1876 for the 4th of July centennial celebration, a much bigger thing than the 56th anniversary centennial celebration in Brandon, Vermont. It was submitted anonymously to the compilers of the 1892 Protestant Episcopal Hymnal, and author Daniel C. Roberts' name was rightly given credit when the hymn was accepted for that hymnal. He was the rector of St. Thomas Episcopal Church in Brandon. The personal pronouns were updated by the Inter-Lutheran Commission on Worship for inclusion in the Lutheran Book of Worship, LBW, in 1978. The text does vary across the different denominational hymnals, so there's some differences between our Lutheran version and non-Lutheran versions, as we do with a lot of hymns that don't come from a Lutheran tradition. Mm. That little Lutheran spin on it. Exactly. The tune is named National Hymn. It was composed by George W. Warren for this hymn text because this hymn was chosen to be the theme hymn at the celebration of the centennial of the United States Constitution in New York in 1887. So hmm. this one has been quite the American hymn for the nation for a long time, which is why it's popular hmm. among all denominations. So for kicks and giggles, Battle Hymn of the Republic yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> was written by abolitionist writer Julia Ward Howe who lived 1819 to 1910. She's also known for writing... I got all this from the internet. This is not in any of our hymnal companions, just to be clear. Nice. Was, she was known for writing the 1870 pacifist Mother's Day Proclamation, which called on women to unite for peace in the world. She was an advocate for abolitionism and a social activist, particularly for women's suffrage. This song was written in November 1861, it was first published in the Atlantic Monthly in February 1862, which is Civil War era. It links the judgment of the wicked at the end of the age with the American Civil War. And she wrote her lyrics to the music of the song John Brown's Body, which is a very interesting thing. The words and music all have their ties to camp meetings in the southern U.S. during this time. The song is highly popular with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. The oh. version you've heard online is probably them. And it's sung all over the place. It's a very popular American patriotic song. For a lot of theological reasons, it's not included in any of our Lutheran hymnals. But I know it's a super popular one. So that's a little bit on that. And finally, also for kicks and giggles, since we sing it so frequently during Major League Baseball games, seven <clears throat> inning stretches, which... Take me out to the ball game? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, only since September 11th, 2001, God Bless America. Mm. Ah. Very popular for seventh inning stretches, huh. which I thought that it had always been a thing. But then I realized it had not always been a thing. I just my memory doesn't go back much prior to 2001 because yeah, I was only true. like five, 13, oh, okay. 12, nine. I was a young child. So <laughs> this And I didn't I don't actually know anything about this until I looked it up. It was written by Irving Berlin during World War One huh. in 1918. Right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. revived in 1938 as the world was devolving into World War Two. Irving Berlin was Jewish and had immigrated to the U.S. from Russia at age five. So during World War Two, he took up the song again as a song of peace. It was introduced on Armistice Day in 1938 by Kate Smith on her radio show, and it became her calling card for the rest of her career. It takes the form of a prayer asking a maybe generic God to bless America. It is sung all over the place from political venues to entertainment to nearly every professional sports league. Very, very American patriotic song. That is all I have. Wow. Very impressive. I'm curious what you guys think. If you have a favorite one of these, if you didn't and now you do, or if the tides have turned for your opinions on these hymns. You know, I've always loved Lift Every Voice and Sing. I didn't realize it was categorized as a nation national song, which yeah. is great. I, I still kind of have mixed emotions about quote unquote patriotic songs in the church. That's fair. I um, do too. <laughs> so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go with that and leave it at that. Cool. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it isn't something that I really ever thought about until more recent years. 
isn't something that occurred to me. It's because of things that I would hear from other people that that started me thinking about, is there a time and place for these sort of hymns? And honestly, yes, the ones that we have in our hymnal, Mm -hmm. indeed, they are prayers. And it is very appropriate to pray for the place. And you could pray this whether you are a citizen of the U.S. or any other country. Like Mm -hmm. you could totally sing these, these hymns and they would be prayers to God for your country. They aren't calling out America specifically. Right. They are for the place where God has has given you to live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I, I feel okay about that. I think there is still just in the in the time and place that we live in, it does give me more pause. But yeah. it's also a good thing to like it is good to stop and consider what what is our context and when is it a good thing and when does it start veering off of being a good, right, and salutary sort of thing to do into something that isn't, that doesn't have the focus where it should be in particularly in a worship service. That's why we have Dr. Um, Norfolk. I know, (laughs) I know. And honestly, yeah, the the three that are in there, add four with Eternal Father starting to save, I'd be glad to sing any of those, um, honestly, anytime. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting. I'm, I'm, Digging back into ancient history for us, well, what feels like ancient history at this point. Obviously, you know, as a as a Navy chaplain's wife, this whole two kingdoms thing is something that we deal with every day. And the whole should we have patriotic hymns at a military based chapel service? The answer is yes, we're going to have them. (laughs) Um, Appropriate context, yeah, (laughs) right. And I, I think they can be very a very moving part of a service i know when ken was in the parish and the time came for you know fourth of july veterans day etc one little little it's subtle but choice one subtle choice he would make would be to do the patriotic hymns as the opening and closing hymns before the invocation after the benediction Ah. so that you know the actual the actual hymns sung between those two mm-hmm. markers tended to be chosen not because of their patriotism, but because of their tie into the liturgical year or the readings or what, you know, so that he would give a nod to the fact that our country is celebrating this and definitely include it in the prayers for sure, but yeah. say, all right, let's keep these at the, you know, outside ends of the service. And mm-hmm. then once we do that invocation, we're not here for our nation. We're here for our Lord. Mm-hmm. So those are those are subtle choices, similar to the you know the those who choose to have flags in the sanctuary but not in the chancel. You know it that we find a way to sort of exist in the tension. Now, obviously, at the Navy base chapel, we sing "Eternal Father, Strong to Save" every chance we get, and it's wonderful every time. <laughs> and no, we don't worry about where it is in the service, but it's that tension. It is mm-hmm. it is there, and it's a good thing that it's there. Because it can be, it can be so rife with abuses if we don't continue to wrestle with it. Mm-hmm. Um, because our God is the God of the whole world, right? Not just our nation. Yeah. And while there have been many Christians in this nation to say that this is, you know, a God ordained Christian nation on par with, you know, Israel and the Old Testament. Um, I, I don't think we can necessarily say that um, with any confidence. So, yeah, let's continue to exist in the tension. But, yes, let's continue to thank God for the gifts mm-hmm. he gives us yes. through our nation mm-hmm. and to pray for our nation. And, yeah, dig in and find the good hymns. Mm-hmm. I really do appreciate, like you said, the work of the hymnal hymnal editors in, in sifting out and, and sifting in, you know, the, mm-hmm. the best of the best, the ones that really do the best job of navigating that tension and giving us solid hymnody. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, ladies, happy Independence Day, 4th of July. I would love to know more of your opinions on hymns for our nation and or patriotic songs. So we can always continue that conversation in our Facebook group, the Lutheran Ladies Lounge. You can join us there. That hymn poll is still up if you want to comment on that or just, you know, tell us how you celebrate, if you celebrate 
Fourth of July in service at all, what your church does or chooses not to do. It's an interesting conversation, something that I think is good for us to consider. You can also follow us on Instagram at Lutheran Ladies Lounge. Find all kinds of interesting stuff there as well. If you are not on social, or if you want to just get the Lutheran Ladies Lounge in your inbox, you can get our monthly e-newsletter. You can find out how to do that in the show notes of this episode, or you can just send an email to lutheranladies at kfuo.org, and we'll make sure you get signed up for that. You can find all of our episodes at kfuo.org slash Lutheran Ladies Lounge, or on the KFUO radio app, or on your favorite podcasting app. You're listening to the Lutheran Ladies Lounge Podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm Aaron. I'm proud to be in. (laughs) And I'm Rachel. (laughs) That hurt me a little bit. (laughs) And now for a special treat. Thanks to Peter Slayton, my husband Luther, and Philip and Cheryl Magnus for joining me for Eternal Father Strong to Save. Eternal Father Strong to Save, whose arm hath bound the restless wing, who bids the mighty ocean deep its own Views and opinions expressed on the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast may not represent the official position of the management or ownership of KFUO Radio, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. The Lutheran Ladies Lounge is produced by KFUO Radio and available at kfuo.org or wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and leave a review for us, too. If you love the Lutheran Ladies Lounge podcast, consider financially supporting our producer, KFUO Radio, so we can keep doing what we do. Find out how at kfuo.org give.
The Lutheran Ladies' Lounge podcast is underwritten in part by Lutheran Heritage Foundation. LHF translates, publishes, distributes, and introduces books that are Bible-based, Christ-centered, and Reformation-driven. Learn more about their global ministry and how to support their projects at lhfmissions.org.